Thanks very much, Stephen. It's a great honour for me to come here. I'm a fellow of the Society, and a few weeks ago we had a, a rather splendid study day. If you weren't able to get to that, look at it online, because all of the papers, and indeed some songs also. I'm not going to burst into song here. A spur, medieval, found in a tree root, allegedly discovered on the battlefield of Agincourt. Been there so long that it has grown into the tree root, so it must be authentic. Well, the problem is there are two others. This is a forgery of the early 20th century. The wood was softened and the spur put into it. And it takes me right to the problem with Agincourt, that it is the thing of which myths are made. We have no surviving objects <coughs> from the battle. I'll say a little bit more about the battlefield later on. And not surprisingly then, there's been a great desire to invent things. There is quite a famous uh, manuscript illumination as well. It is often used in newspapers and book covers. In fact, that also was a forgery of the early 20th century, but the V&A have it as a kind of original document. It is, it is not. The other famous myth about Agincourt is the V sign, that the V sign was invented there. I can't find the origins of that story. We know that one of the chronicles of the time actually gives a battle speech for Henry. There are many battle speeches, incidentally, given for Henry. And it says that if the archers are caught, they'll have fingers cut off. I think, again, it's an early 20th century myth. The First World War has a lot to do with this interest in Agincourt and in things military, because after all, the battle was fought not very far away from the, the Somme, and as you're going to see, George V actually visited nearby uh, twice during the First World War. But it just shows also how quickly history moves on. You may not remember the origin of this cartoon by Matt in the Daily Telegraph, it was concerning Ed Ball's suggestion uh, that when Shadow Chancellor, that maybe you should or should not give receipts for workmen when you paid them in cash. It just shows this sort of enduring myth, though, of the, the V sign and Agincourt. And of course, the bottle is still used politically today. When George Osborne announced a million pounds to go to Agincourt, as also to Waterloo in the budget in March, he had the battle of showing a strong leader, I think we know which political party was meant for him that, uh, defeating an ill-judged alliance between the champion of a united Europe, the French force implied there, and a renegade force of Scottish nationalists. <laughs> Not true, there are no Scots involved in the Battle of Agincourt. That didn't stop us having a piper at the battlefield on Sunday, to great success. The piper actually piped in the French on that occasion. But do have a look at the website, actioncourt600.com, for more material. Now, the campaign of Henry in 1415 is actually quite well known and, and pretty easily described. Henry set off from Southampton in the middle of August, and he landed at Harfleur here. He'd signed up his army for 12 months, so this was intended as a campaign of conquest, and he duly began to besiege the town of Harfleur, a very important port from which there'd been quite a lot of raids on the south coast of England. Unfortunately, it proved quite a difficult place to take. It took six months from his initial landing for it to surrender. And for various reasons that I'll show you some documents linked to later, he decided to cut the campaign short. He therefore left Harfleur with his army around the 6th or the 8th of October, intending to get out of France as quickly as possible. And to do that, he walked, marked his army up here, to the crossing of the somewhat Blanche Tac, where his great-grandfather, Edward III, had crossed in 1346. But when he got there, he heard from French prisoners that there was a great French army on the other side of the river, and he didn't dare to chance a crossing. Therefore, he brought his army southwards along the Somme, being shadowed by the French all the way along, until he eventually found a crossing point on the 19th of October. So this long march is a characteristic of this campaign. The French came out of Perron, where they'd been gathering, and the herald summoned him to battle. So Agincourt is also a pre-arranged battle, although we can't be sure whether they arranged it for Azincourt or for <coughs> another place, Aubigny-en-Artois. A couple of French chronicles 
implied that that was the place they had appointed for the battle to take place. Now, there's something very interesting about this. Everything in this route here suggests Henry was battle avoiding. There's only been one historian, the American Clifford Rogers, who's argued otherwise. Henry, therefore, is trying to avoid an engagement with the French. Here, if he was heading for Aubigny, you can see he turns in a completely different direction. Was he again trying to avoid battle? Whatever the case, he then moves forward, northwards here towards Calais, and he is intercepted. The French get to Azincourt ahead of him on the 24th of October, and battle is given on the 25th of October. One thing that's often forgotten about this, we go on about this march, which incidentally was about 23 kilometers a day, that's about as fast as an army could move at that point, is that the French are also moving long distances. Most of their troops are gathering in Rouen in late September, early October, although the king himself, Charles VI and his son, do not go to Rouen until Henry has left. We've got to remember that relations between the English and the French had been bad for quite a long time now. The Hundred Years' War had begun in the previous century, and Henry V very much reopened the war because he knew of divisions in France, and he was also trying to um, strengthen his own position in England, where he is, after all, the son of a usurper. Henry IV had usurped the throne in, 40, in 1399. And so we've got to remember that relations had been bad for a long time, and therefore the French were hesitant to engage Henry at Harfleur, because battles in the past at Crecy in 1346 and Poitiers in 1356 had led to great French defeats, and even worse in 1356, the capture of the French king. And therefore, whilst we love this story of the underdog, that the English were always at a disadvantage. The newspapers over the weekend have been full of this against all the odds and that kind of thing. We've got to remember that the French were themselves anxious about this, could not get a large enough army together while he was at Harfleur, and even then hesitated about what to do. But it's when he crosses the Somme that they really make up their minds to give him battle. Maybe they think by then that he has marched long distances, he'd be running out of food, by then, uh, that battle is actually given. But what I want to put into your minds right from the start is that this is a much more complex event than uh, we might get, certainly from Shakespeare, but even from some modern popular history books. The army, the English army, is exceptionally well documented. That's nothing to do with Agincourt itself, except that this is the first time since 1359, that a king has led an army to France in person. So, over 50 years since a king has led an army in person. It is the largest army to leave England since 1346. It is a very large-scale event. And when Henry went to the city of London for a loan, he got 10,000 marks from them, he said he intended to invade with no small army. So it has a much greater scale to it right from the start. It is meant to be a significant invasion. As I say, these contracts, we have one here for Sir Thomas Erpingham to bring 20, archer, uh, 20 men at arms and 60 archers. Uh, we know that they were intended to serve for 12 months. Using these documents, I think I've got another one coming up here. Yes, this is Thomas Lord Camoys, the commander of the rear guard at the the battle for retinue just slightly uh, larger. Um, these documents, we know that around 320 men engage to bring troops. It is a huge recruitment exercise here. And we know also that most of the retinues were in a special ratio of one man-at-arms to three archers, like Erpingham's 20 men-at-arms and 60 archers. So Henry had a clear idea of the sort of army he wanted, already quite archer-rich. In the late 14th century, the ratio had been one man-at-arms to one archer. So he's already increased the number of archers. You're going to say, well, that's because he knew he was going to fight a battle at Agincourt, and he knew just how useful they would be. Well, no, the archers 
are useful in all military situations, sieges, skirmishes, sorties, patrolling, as well as a battle situation. And Henry had experienced battle in 1403, where he'd been wounded in the face by an arrow. But the beauty of the archer was that he was cheap. You could get two archers for every man at arms. Archers were paid sixpence a day. All the terms and conditions are in these contracts here, whereas a man at arms was paid a shilling a day. A man at arms has the full plate armour, and his role then was to fight hand to hand, on foot usually, but they would be able to fight from horseback as well. These are the well trained men, the professional soldiers. Uh, the archers, many of those came from the households, many of them were servants. For instance, the old marshal uh, had his barber with him and he served as an archer. Think Downton Abbey, really, for this kind of army. In fact, quite similar to some of the First World War uh, recruitment as well. These men doubled up as servants and uh, as soldiers as well. But they would have needed to have recruited archers locally. No commissions of a reign were used to raise archers, but we would have had archers recruited from uh, communities. Now, this is very interesting in financial terms. Henry didn't have enough money to pay his troops. They had to be paid for six months' service before they set out. The money was given to the captain. He then gave it out to his men. But Henry didn't have enough. He only had enough for three months. The nobles wouldn't go on this campaign unless he could find some more. So he raided the royal jewel cupboards, he got out plate and jewels, and then had it weighed and gave the captains the silver, if you like, even though it's in the object form, to them, worth three months worth of wages. The idea being that they could deposit it with London goldsmiths and get the money like a sort of uh, uh, hog system and then give it to their men, or they could just pay from their own pocket and then Henry would redeem these items and he set up a redemption date in January 1417. So he'd very much mortgaged the future for this campaign. And that also explains a lot as to why he was determined to be successful. Either successful in getting out of France without too much damage, or at the battle, winning the battle. And I think it explains a lot about the killing of the prisoners. He cannot afford to lose this campaign. We have the testimony of a French spy who says that Henry was weak in England, that there were other people plotting against him. And even as he left Southampton, there were people trying to seize the throne from him. So again, the complexity of the political situation is worth noting. This is one of the receipts for uh, uh, payment given to Thomas Lord Camels <coughs> by uh, the Earl of Arundel, the Treasurer of England. Now, I've said on many occasions, this is war according to accountants. It's all right, Thomas Oakingham saying, yes, I will bring 20 men at arms and 60 archers, but you want to check that he has actually done that. And we have these muster rolls before the campaign. This one's taken quite close to my office in Southampton. And you can see the 20 men at arms there at the top, the 60 archers at the bottom. They've all been ticked off with a little dot beside their name when they turned up. And we've got four in the middle. Lance outre la nombre, lances in addition to the number. Lance is another word for man at arms at this point. These are people who've turned up, want to go on the campaign, but are not in the payroll. In a way, they're helping for other people to die. So the enthusiasm for this campaign, to go on it, is quite substantial. This is a big campaign led by a king, leading to substantial conquests, to ransoms, to all the benefits that soldiers would get in addition to their daily wage. Erpingham himself was paid four shillings a day. So he's a knight banneret. The Duke of York was paid 13 shillings and fourpence a day. There was a lot of benefit in going on these sorts of campaigns. Archers then are already present in the retinues, but Henry also recruited archer companies. This is the famous South Welsh Company. Some of them here from Cardiganshire, Carmarthenshire, and these ones are from Brecon, Er Cantrasilly, uh, <coughs> around there. You can see these names. I can tell you it's extremely difficult putting Welsh names into a computer database. <laughs> uh, but we have done this. They're already on medievalsoldier.org, but we're doing a special Agincourt database, which will be finished by the time the funding runs out at the end of March next year. So not only have we got this special 500 from South Wales, none from the north, because Glendower is still at large, probably dies in this year, 500 from Lancashire, and perhaps 650 from Cheshire. So we've got these extra archer companies there. 
As I say, Harfleur was a very difficult place to besiege because it could be flooded, rather like what happened in Belgium at the beginning of the First World War. The French were able to flood all of this area, making it rather insanitary. Men got dysentery and the causes of the time were explained by carcasses and animals being thrown into there and that kind of thing. You've got Henry then on this side here. These are hills above the town and his brother, the Duke of Clarence, on this side here. And it seems that this was the sickly camp, although there's quite a number become ill in the King's camp as well. This is also the side where mining took place. We have miners from the Forest of Dean recruited for that purpose. And we also have gunners here. Uh, this <coughs> picture is taken from Matt Bennett's Osprey book, and in fact says English guns, yes, but German gunners. We did not have expertise in gunnery at this point, and the gunners taken on this campaign, some of my students working on this, actually were uh, all German. It was difficult to take Harfleur, but eventually it surrendered on the 18th of September, for formal surrender on the 22nd. However, Henry realised that he had lost a number of men at this siege, and also others had dysentery and probably couldn't continue on the campaign, and were best then sent home. But he was a control freak, so people had to have a little exeat to get away. And this is attached to a list of <coughs> names. This is stamped with the signature of the Seneschal and Chamberlain of the Household. This is the 6th of October. So as he starts to move away from Harfleur, he's deciding who can go home. And we actually have lists of sick men. And these are amazing uh, as well. And see the ones down at the bottom there are actually some of the Welsh archers here who don't get to... Adjun Court, they are actually invalided home. We've calculated uh, that these two main lists have about 1,500 names in them, so we can say that that number were sent home. However, I have a problem because some of these men's names are also in documents saying they were at the Battle of Adjun Court. And it is possible that these are lists of sick rather than lists of men invalided home, and therefore some of them may be recovered enough to continue with the fight. Uh, it's also interesting that in Jonathan Sumption's recent <laughs> book, uh, Cursed Kings, he has a chapter on Adjunct, and he says 2,000 English soldiers died at Harfleur. I found 50. In fact, there is quite a lot of documentary evidence here. We have another role. This is the Earl of Arundel's muster, and you'll see replacements came in there. So we shouldn't underestimate how many Henry still had with him. The reason we know what happened to the troops is because after the campaign, there were more financial records drawn up. This is Erpingham's, and we also have the retinue lists that were drawn up. This is Camoy's. Now, these show how few people actually died at the Siege of Harfleur. And so far, from about 80 retinues, I can only find 50 men. Now, there were 300 retinues, okay, so we haven't got all of the evidence, but to get to 2,000 is impossible. So it is a figure taken from chronicle evidence rather than from these sorts of sources. Henry, however, did need to put 1,200 into garrison. So if he lost 1,500 going home, 1,200 into garrison, perhaps 50 multiplied by whatever you think we need, like perhaps about 300 uh, dying at the battle altogether, we can see that he still had about 8,500 men with him. But... Of those, only 1,000 to 1,500 were men-at-arms, about 7,000 were archers. It's just the way the death toll went that Henry now had an even more archer-rich army for the, the march, and that's going to be very significant for the battle. But I hope you can see from this, we actually have a huge amount of material that we can use. We don't need to use the chronicle sources, which, as we'll see in a minute when we look at the French, are very misleading indeed. But you can just see here, virtually the whole of... Camoy's retinue was with him at the battle. He's the rear guard on the left, so probably engaging less in the fighting than the Duke of York's company on the right. So that's how these battles were conducted. But this one here, Samson Brockas, was uh, stayed within the town of Harfleur. So we know he was one soldier from the retinue of Camoy's who was detailed into Harfleur. If you go to the very good exhibition, uh, of the Royal Armouries at the Tower of London. This one's actually up on the wall, and underneath it is a little um, touch screen. You can touch it and see what happened to people. We put in the retinues they were in, what their rank was, and also what their fate was 
on the campaign and play around with it, so we'll be putting it online in due course. So lots of material to draw on, and also on ransoms. This is from Camoys saying the men of his retinue took ransoms, uh, and out of that Camoys got a, a cut and so did the crown, so we know how much was made uh, from ransoms from each retinue. And then just end with this little uh, picture here, in uh, the period before metal filing cabinets, what, or even wooden ones, what you did was put all of Erpium's documents into a little uh, bag here, uh, made from cheap skin, essentially, and you tied it up and hung it on a peg with the name Erpingham written over it. So a filing system, oh. medieval style. <laughs> We're back then on the campaign, and we've got to about here, just south of Corby, and Henry hears from French prisoners, because remember there's a lot of military activities going on during this all the time, uh, that the French have a cunning plan. And the plan is to send cavalry against the archers. So the French already know that the archers could be a threat to them, even though they've not fought a pitched battle against the English for quite a long time. And so Henry famously orders the archers to prepare stakes. I gave a, a talk at the Weald and Downland Museum down in Sussex, and it was very interesting there, because obviously they do a lot of timber uh, structures there, and one man came up with some very interesting ideas of what dimension the stakes would be and how it would be part of the coppicing site. Because you would think, how on earth could they do it in the middle of enemy territory? Uh, probably they're not that thick, but they've got to be strong enough to be able to hammer them in to the ground and also sharpen them, possibly with one of those uh, kind of um, a pruning uh, devices or bark removing uh, devices there. But this is going to be also very important. It's the first known use of a stake wall in Western Europe, but it had been used by the Turks at the Battle of Nicopolis in 1396. And there'd been some Englishmen there, so probably it has come into knowledge in the West. Now, the other fascinating thing about this is we do actually have the French battle plan. It survives. It was found in the British Library in the 1980s by Christopher Philpotts. And I, we don't know how it got to England. I like to think, because of course I admire Henry V tremendously, that actually it was captured during this march. It's not specifically for Agincourt. The French thought they might fight at any point along the Somme. And it doesn't have in this plan the Duke of Orleans, who's going to end up as commander on the day, or the Duke of Bourbon, so second in command, but it has all of these features. It has the plan to override the archers with the cavalry. It has a plan to have a certain number of French divisions, and also the plan to attack the baggage. So again, I hope you will leave today thinking how sophisticated <laughs> medieval warfare is, because sometimes the way it's talked about, it's like a stag weekend in the Pas de Calais. <laughs> <laughs> We've had that last weekend. So. Anyway, here we are at Agincourt, or probably, we don't actually know where the battle was fought, but this is the traditional site and this is where the monument was erected, in fact, just about there. So the seat of the battle is thought to be in the middle here, Azincourt is across here, Tramcourt here, Rousseville, there where the French are supposed to be, and uh, maison Cell down here where the English are. So you are the English. Yeah, you would imagine the French are coming at you there. We've got three um, groups of men-at-arms, the king in the centre, the Duke of York on the right, it's a little far forward, the Lord Camoys on the left. 65 years old, Lord Camoys was chosen because he was married into the royal family, but also because as an elderly man, he would be able to hold his troops firm while the others started fighting, because they sort of come in one division after the other. You've got some archers in front of you, initially, although they're going to fall back when the French men-at-arms come to grips with you in the melee, and then you've got archers flanking. They must be huge flanking, or rather like a horseshoe-shaped flanking there, uh, because one French chronicle comments on the idea of being encircled by the, the English archers. You remember the number I've said, 7,000 or more, they've got to be accommodated, maybe in the woodland on uh, each side, which is also <coughs> talked about. There are problems with this battlefield. It's not the most obvious place for a battle, because they're usually fought on uh, slightly hilly land, and I'll show you some other possible locations towards the end of the talk. Now, the soil there, as colleagues who were with us at the weekend will testify, is very um, sort of cloying. In fact, there is one there, we call it a croyelle. 
And if you get it on your shoes, I still haven't cleaned mine. I couldn't bring myself to do it this morning. When I did it in a hotel a few weeks ago in France, I actually blocked the sink. It is, you can see why it was a problem. And the intriguing thing here is that Henry seems, no doubt through scouting, to have been able to put his men on ground that is less uh, problematic and that the French have to come through this area, maybe also churned up by their horses, exercising in it the night before. It's like a bridle path. You can be bad about just how terrible it is moving across that kind of terrain. Now, we know that some of the French are going to fall over into this and they can't get up again because people are piling on top of them. If you did fall face down into this, it would be very, very difficult indeed. There's a tremendous suction effect. And work done by soil scientists on this area has very much shown that. So the, the terrain is significant. So you've got to say, why did the French choose this ground? Or how was it possible that Henry managed to get the better position on the day, even though he arrived second onto the battlefield? There's a lot of problems about this. I think the French, uh, it's also intriguing that Henry gets there on the 24th and he sets his men into battle array straight away. He thinks the French are going to attack him straight away, and indeed they should have done. That would be to their advantage. They choose not to, and that's because they're still hoping more troops will come. Because it's very difficult getting everybody to the right place, even more so if some of them have been told it was at Aubigny. The Duke of Brabant, we know, arrives late. The Duke of Brittany gets no further than Amiens, doesn't get there in time. There are several other troops that don't get there in time. So I'm estimating around 12,000 French, and I'll say a bit more about the numbers in a minute. But just to show you then what is going to happen, the first attack then would be the cavalry on each side against the archers. And yet the French cannot get enough men to volunteer to be in that cavalry. And it shows really the command problem. The king is mad, the Dauphin is not on the campaigns. They're worried about the English. So the leading commander is a 21-year-old, the Duke of Orleans, who's never been in a pitch battle before. Maybe then he can't command the troops to do this, but this is a pretty bad indictment if the commander cannot force men to do these military actions. And the other thing that's said, maybe they don't like fighting against archers because what honour is there to be gained in that? You're not going to get ransoms that way. But I reckon they're also very worried about their horses. Extremely expensive, well-trained horses, extremely vulnerable to arrow shot. They're not fully armoured, and therefore I think there was a disinclination to engage in that manoeuvre in the battle. But it is a disaster for the French because instead of the archers being overridden by the French cavalry. Instead, the French cavalry cannot penetrate. That's what the stakes were about, to stop the horses getting at the archers. Archers have no plate armour. They have helmets and reinforced jerkins, but they are not suitable for fighting in the melee. Therefore, they've got to be wholly protected, and they are by the stakes, but also the, the shot, which I think is in volleys, I don't think we need to know how many an archer can shoot in a minute, because I think they are more like Zulu, if you know that very famous uh, shooting thing where one lot shoots, then the other shoots. I think it's that kind of situation. And that's even more scary. Can you imagine, you pretend to be the French for a minute or two, imagine you're walking along and then all of a sudden there's hundreds of tennis balls being thrown at you. Yeah? And some of you get knocked down, some of you fall over, others fall on top of you. The rest of you keep going, and you're thinking, is there going to be another one? And yes, there is, but you don't know when it's going to be. And it's not so likely that the archers will be loosening all the time, because the search by Tom Richardson at the Royal Armoury says that archer, uh, arrows come in groups of 24. 48 were issued for the campaign. So it's not wholly clear how many they had. And you don't need to have lots each if you've got 7,000 archers there. The other thing that happens with arrow fire, or arrow shot, I should say, it's not fire, uh, is that it has the effect of, particularly for the men-at-arms moving forward on foot, of making you crowd in on each other. That's a natural reaction. And work done on crowd control shows this too, that you would all bunch together you get so close, you cannot raise your weapon arm. And it's also right <coughs> for 
falling over, as I say, others falling on top of you, and the heaps that are mentioned, the heaps of dead in which some people are living and then you're pulled out later, are a characteristic of the narratives of this account. So, how much actual fighting there is, how many actually get through to fight with the English men-at-arms on foot is quite dubious. Maybe you wouldn't want to be the Duke of York's lot on his side because you are the ones who are going to suffer. We know that at least 90 people in the Duke of York's retinue died and the Earl of Suffolk, whose father had died at half blood, he'd only recently inherited, died at the battle as well. So the right gets the full force, but Camoy's retinue, as far as I can see, has no dead in it at all. So what we also see from this helpful diagram is it's not clear how many of these further French divisions, we don't know quite whether they had two divisions or three, um, but we see here that quite a lot of them run away. And that also means it doesn't really matter how many men you have in an army if they do not all engage. And that's essentially what happens at Agincourt. So treason and cowardice are a feature of French narratives. Now it brings me to the question of the, the French army sizes. Chronicles are a common source we use. They are sort of narrative accounts. It's sort of history, if you like, as it was written at the time. We have about 28 chronicles written within 50 years of the battle. The most famous, the Gesta Henrici Quinti, written by 1417 <coughs> in Latin. Quite a lot of these texts were written by monks, very few by eyewitnesses, but they follow a tradition of historical writing. They're not unique to Agincourt. Even if you look at things from the 14th century, Walsingham, who's listed there, wrote a chronicle that went from the 1370s through to 1422. So they are general histories in which Agincourt features. Now, Walsingham's account of Agincourt is very interesting because he knew very little about the battle, and so he just put in lots of quotes from classical texts instead. Now, you can see here that the figures they give on the English chronicles for the French army are huge. Absolutely huge. 60,000 seems quite small, doesn't it, really? Uh, now, the problem with the 60,000 is it's a very popular number with medieval chronicles. It means a large number. How many peasants were there from Kent in London in 1381? 60,000. Clever, because the population of Kent, using the poll tax, was only about 51,000. And we assume that women and children didn't turn up. Indeed, not every peasant turned up. So these are not credible numbers. They mean something. There's quite a strong biblical influence as well in these kinds of things. So we really cannot use them except comparatively. So if, for instance, the jester had said 30,000 for something else, what we're seeing is he thinks that's smaller than that but we cannot use them for their actual figures. And that's true of all battles. It's not unique to this. I've done a lot on Bosworth. It's exactly the same problem. Notice also that the French chroniclers give much lower figures for their troops. Yeah, well, of course, you're bound to say it's like fishermen, isn't it? You know, it was this big. <laughs> really, the English are bound to say they, the French were in very large numbers. So the French already are, are producing a difficulty, including two down here, the Berry Herald and the Point de Richemont, Richemont's actually present at the battle, it's written by one of his servants, actually say that the English are outnumbered the French. So again, it is not at all clear on the French side how many were there. I've used some financial records, so we've got very similar sources for the French side, except just not as many of them. But probably the third bullet point's the most important, that after the English invaded, Charles VI raised a tax to cover the cost of 9,000 men. We know that they then issued a, a summons of the nobles, and people would have turned up for that, but they turned up with very small companies, so I've allowed another 3,000 in to get a total of 12,000. Okay, it might be a few thousand more than that, but we're in that kind of territory here. And I can also compare with the reforms of the 1440s, very much modelled on the English success, where we know that Charles VII raised 
7,200 in the men-at-arms uh, group and 8,000 archers. So we know what the French got to by the 1440s. They couldn't really have been there already in 1415. I'm starting now to do the same with the French muster rolls as I can with the English. This is just to show you the sort of thing. These are mustering on the 22nd of September at Rouen. We've got quite a lot of documentation. For instance, we know that the Duke of Bourbon, uh, sorry, the Duke of Berry, had 1,500 men. He wasn't at the battle, but we can assume most of those were there. Now, that's interesting because the Duke of Clarence is the peer on the English side with the largest company, 960 men. So if the Duke of Berry has 1,500 men, we're sort of seeing, roughly speaking, the, the relationship, perhaps, between the two armies. But many companies, as in England, were very small. And also, something I've done is look at later French armies. And if we were to say that the French had 60,000 at Agincourt, then we're in the reign of Louis XIV. It is impossible that the French had that number. They could not with their population base. Furthermore, they couldn't because this is a regional battle. Imagine life without a mobile phone. You can't phone down to Lyon and say, we're planning a battle at Azincourt, but there's a very good TGV. If you get on it, you know, you'll be there. <laughs> no, it is a local battle. Oops. And this is where the dead and the prisoners came from. It is entirely from the society in Picardy, Artois, and Upper Normandy there. It's a very nice French version of this actually just appeared on the website. So if I look at casualties as well, the chronicles tell us three to 12,000 people died. Monstrelet, one well, important French chronicle, is 5,800. Yet, he only names 273. Uh, there we are, they're ringing to tell you where to go for the battle. <laughs> uh, in fact, we can only identify 500 people who died at this battle. Now, you've got to put a multiplier to that, like the dead at half floods. So we haven't got all the records, but it cannot be the sorts of figures given. Maybe 2,000, 1,500 to 2,000 would be credible. The same with the prisoners. We've been able to identify, but we found a few more recently, about 320 prisoners now. But these are the credible figures. <coughs> just want to end with a few things about why Agincourt has still lingered on in the English or English-speaking uh, <coughs> mentality. It was not a decisive battle. The Duke of Orleans, there was no effort to, he was the main prisoner, no effort to ransom him or no serious effort because France was divided and his enemy, the Duke of Burgundy, not at the battle, had no intention of redeeming his enemy. In fact, the Burgundians were able to get control of the government, essentially, through what had happened at Agincourt. The king was not captured. Although there were some valuable prisoners, some of those 300, it was a bit like winning the lottery at the time for the soldiers themselves. It did not have an effect on international diplomacy. Rather like at Cressy, the French were so humiliated by this defeat, that they didn't want to come to the negotiating table at all. There were efforts of mediation in 1416, but essentially they didn't take up any opportunities, and Henry invaded again in 1417. In fact, he raised an army of 7,000 to save Harfleur in 1416 in a naval battle, and he invaded again in 1417 and took all of Normandy, as he'd probably been intending to do. In 1419, there was an assassination by the Dauphin, then the leader of the Orleanist party in the absence of the Duke of Orleans, murdering the Duke of Burgundy. And there's going to be a radio programme about this, I think, uh, next week, and on Radio 4. And what this means is that the English then ally with the Burgundians, and Henry is accepted in 1420 as heir to the throne of France. Shakespeare, of course, rushes us straight from the Battle of Agincourt to the Treaty of Troyes in 1420 and the marriage to Catherine. In fact, there's a lot of fighting in between and a lot of political divisions within France, which is what gets Henry the, the heirship in 1420. So Shakespeare has a lot to answer for, 
both in terms of the fame of Adrincourt, it's a battle we've all seen, alarms and excursions, it doesn't actually give much battle scene in it, it's a comic scene with Monsieur Le Fer and Pistol, and then the French rush on, that's what excursions mean, so they rush on the stage and say, all is lost, all is lost, and then rush off again, uh, probably to take another part, you know, because that's how these plays worked. But this play, uh, probably the first produced at the Globe in 1599, is really what everybody remembers about Agincourt. Ironic, because there are no archers in Shakespeare's Henry V. This portrait, there's a lot of interest in the medieval past in the Tudor period, and this portrait uh, is one of a number, in fact, there's one in this building here uh, from the 16th century. 1599 then for Shakespeare, but this coincided with a period of great activity by the heralds and men claiming that they were gentlemen. James I, after all, was fanning this later with the idea of creating baronetcies and all of that sort of thing. So the heralds were copying out lists, and this is the Agincourt roll. It exists in three copies, one in the College of Arms, one in uh, the Bodleian Library, and one in the British Library, and these were copied out by Robert Glover, in the 1580s, he was Somerset Herald. The idea being that when he and the other heralds went out into the counties and people said, I should be a gentleman, and they said, well, what grounds have you for that? They said, well, my ancestor served at Agincourt. Not just Agincourt, um, Henry VIII's campaigns were wheeled out in the same way, the Battle of Wakefield in 1460. So there are certain battles that, that they thought would help in their claim to get a coat of arms. So that's what this is. Now, interestingly, this is from a lost original. There was a medieval roll of this sort. It doesn't seem to survive. But Glover only copied out, or the text he copied it from, only named the men at arms, because of course archers couldn't possibly be gentlemen, so there was no need to take those names down. And for many years, people said that we do not know the names of the archers at Agincourt. In fact, we do by using the materials in the National Archives. So this role here has actually misled uh, quite a lot. It occurs on quite a number of websites uh, as a sort of secret, you know, as a sort of, uh, you almost imagine the Templars are behind this list. Uh, you know, it's owned by certain families in America, and for a small sum you can check whether your ancestor served at Agincourt. In fact, it is um, something done by heralds in the late 16th century. But it did, a whole, the, whole, the whole sort of situation of this gentility led to spurious claims. If I yeah, look at the visitations, heraldic visitations for Kent between 1592 and 1619, between those two dates, the Waller family added their, uh, the little coat of arms at the top there on their walnut tree from the name Waller, and that's the coat of the Duke of Orleans. The idea being they'd captured the Duke of Orleans at the battle. Now, Richard Waller was there, but he didn't capture the Duke. He had in his custody John Count of Angoulême, the younger brother of the Duke of Orleans. We would say, well, these French peers are all much of a muchness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Except it was a hostage deal of 1412. It has nothing to do with Agincourt. It gets worse. In the 19th century, the Earls of Kimberley, the Woodhouses, invented this tremendous coat of arms here with Agincourt, the motto at the bottom, the drops of blood, and the cudgel at the top that John Woodhouse is supposed to have used at the battle, going around clonking people on the head with it and shouting, Frat Fort, hit hard. Now, Woodhouse was not at the battle, and that story actually comes from a poem by Michael Drayton, written in 1627. So it's part of this medievalism in the late 16th and early 17th century. Woodhouse's, uh, so Drayton's poem, Battle of Agincourt, written in 1627, is amazing, really. It is a very violent poem. It has some crazy things in it, like they stop fighting to besiege a castle halfway during the battle. Uh, at the end of the battle, the French are defeated and the English force them to carry them on their backs. It's just weird, really. Um, he'd, written, <coughs> he'd already written a shorter poem in 1606, uh, which is uh, uh, the first of the wind uh, for, for, for France. And it sort of has, uh, it's a sort of pseudo medieval poem. So this interest in Agincourt is certainly around in the early 17th century. 
And this is when Davy Gam comes into the story. Davy Gam is mentioned in the Chronicles as dying at the battle. We're not sure why that's the case, but he had indented for it himself and three archers. The first mention of him is in Walter Raleigh's History of the World. And he's sent to spy, and he comes back with this that a Frenchman, there were enough to be killed, enough to be taken prisoner, enough to run away. Now, we don't know why um, Raleigh inserted this, because he's talking about Hannibal at the time. So we don't know where the story came from, but it gets copied into all of these subsequent histories of Wales and uh, Goodwin's history of the reign of Henry V. So it is a story made up in the uh, probably the early 17th century. Over the course of the 18th century, we were at war with the French so often that it was convenient to wheel out Agincourt, really to say we've knocked the hell out of them in the past, we can do it again, lads. It's that sort of feeling. And here we are in the War of Austrian Succession. I mean, British valour has always been there. Notice that it didn't create a problem moving from English to British. Agincourt becomes a British victory, even though technically it is English. Certainly, it was during that uh, war that the princesses of the royal family paid for productions of Shakespeare's Henry V. It's when Henry V starts getting performed very, very frequently. It gets more so in the Seven Years' War there. This idea also coming in, the radical fortitude. You know, we were morally and politically superior to the French, that it was their aristos, they were bound to have a revolution sooner or later, uh, and we were already, uh, you know, men of the soil, all of that kind of thing. And the first invocation of the anniversary newspapers, the first reminder that today is the anniversary of the battle, is in 1757, during the Seven Years' War, fanned by the fact that George III actually acceded to the throne on the 25th of October in 1760. When we continued fighting in the Revolutionary Wars, we get the same sort of thing there. The French preserve their character. They're the same in 1415 as they are now. In 1805, the year of Trafalgar, you could pay a shilling to see this huge painting in the Lyceum. One was done of Seringapatam as well. There. It could evoke the memory of Agincourt. At the Lord Mayor's show in 1815, we've got a float this year, uh, they looked at both Waterloo and Agincourt as great <coughs> victories. Shakespeare continued to be tremendously popular in the, 18th, in the 19th and 20th centuries. This is from the 1850s. The productions got more and more lavish. You had real horses on the stage. You even had dancing girls in the French camp the night before the battle to show <laughs> how degenerate they were. It also got women on the stage, incidentally, in a play that otherwise has very few opportunities. In 1915, of course, we're allies. And these are marvellous scenes of the French welcoming British troops. This was in the Illustrated London News and also in the French newspaper. And they uh, sort of shook hands over this place of previous conflict, but now we're allies, as they said. And they were shown round the field by this French uh, lieutenant colonel. Uh, I'd love to get hold of those handouts that the British officers are holding. We haven't been able to find them. <laughs> but intriguingly, this chap here said that the English had 28,000 men at this battle. Finally, where was it? Well, the earliest map actually shows it to the west of the village of Azincourt there. But the area I showed you before is actually there between Azincourt and Tramcourt. So we do have a problem because the first book about the battle in 1827 did the same. It put it to the west of Azincourt. But the traditional site was first surveyed in 1818 when we occupied that area after the um, Napoleonic Wars. You can see here how the, the two armies are the French up there and then the English are put here and various other features are marked on here, such as grave pits, that kind of thing. Now, the um, surveyor, John Woodford, actually did um, carry out some excavations, but nothing of those now survives, and Victorian excavations are often very difficult to, to sort of rediscover. Uh, and there is some possibility that this map, with its burial of 5,800 knights, remember that's what Monstrelet had said, is more like Tolkien's map of Middle Earth. It is imposing the battle onto an actual terrain. 
we've excavated here around the Calvo where um, Woodhouse, uh, Woodford marked the graves, nothing there at all apart from an oil drill drilling rig from the 1970s. It's possible this field would and more, but the French have not been very keen on excavation recently. A new plaque was put onto this calva, which dates originally to around the Franco-Prussian War. Uh, there are some bodies. These were in the church of Ushi Le Hedan, where the ceremony was held on Sunday morning. And this one of these is Galois Le Fougère, the provost marshal, who was uh, is deemed by the French to be the first gendarme. And so the ceremony at the weekend had a lot about the history of the gendarmerie. It was organized by them. And uh, this body was dug up in the 1930s and is now at the bottom of the gendarmerie monument in Versailles. We know where 54 people were buried on the French side. We know where they were taken to. Uh, these so far are the only ones that have been dug up. We haven't found grave pits. Tim Sutherland has suggested that this could be the site of the battle, with the road through the middle, we're never gonna get that excavated, because some of the accounts talk about a valley, and if you remember what I showed you before was totally flat, so is it this valley here? We're near at Arisaville, Adrian Court is sort of down through there. Another possibility is this position here, we're looking over that, is the center of the battlefield there, but we're looking at it obliquely from Maison Cell, and again, it is much more likely to be the sort of terrain that battles were fought in, where armies adopted a, a hill, a, a sort of hillier position. Memorialising it is also interesting. In 1963, this was put up on St. Joan of Arc's feast day to show that the French won the war, if not the battle. <laughs> The Saint Historique was built in 2001 with European money, very nicely done with a sort of long bow frontage to it. And then finally, on Sunday, Agincourt 600 paid for this rather splendid monument to the dead, both sides with no known uh, graves. And in fact, uh, this was part of the, uh, the, the ceremony. It was a very interesting <coughs> event, uh, I thought, although it showed the characteristics of, of the French, I think, which some of which, in a way, you can date back to Agincourt uh, uh, as well. Um, there were nine speeches <laughs> to this event, because every level of French local government has to uh, contribute. I was honoured to be invited to speak, so I've done a lot of work for the Santé Historique over the years. They wanted me to read it in French and in English, so mine took even longer uh, than that. So it's very interesting, but it was lovely to see on the following day, which is when this picture was taken, a lot of people going to, to have a look, and the museum will be refurbished uh, next year. They've got quite a bit of money to, to do that, and we're hoping there will be excavation. So, as you can see, we know a lot about Adrian, but there's still a lot more to know, particularly from the point of view of the French army and uh, the archaeology of it. So, hope you will continue your interest in the future. Thanks very much. <laughs>